Hello, Hubble Huggers, and welcome to this week's Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And this week, we've got another great hangout planned for you. It's a little bit different this time. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at uh, the man, uh, Edwin Hubble, the astronomer from which uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is named after. And uh, this is the, we are in the week before the 20th anniversary of the launch of this. 25th anniversary of the uh, launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery, which put Hubble into orbit. And all next week, we've got all kinds of festivities and events planned. But I, but then this was Scott's idea, and I thought this was a good one. It'd be a good. This is a great opportunity for us to kind of take a look back at some of the important work that uh, that Edwin Hubble had done back when. Uh, uh, back in the early part of the of the 20th century, and so today he is uh, he is currently out at Mount Wilson with some with some people who are going to help us understand a little bit more about Evan Hubble. But before I get to that, let me give you a couple of announcements. First of all, there is a new Hubble ebook out. It was just put out yesterday uh, to celebrate the 25th anniversary. The link to where you can get it is in the description box below. Also. Uh, if you participate, even though Hubble Mania is over, if you participated and helped vote uh, to select the the winning image, our graphic artists at the institute have put together some printables that you can not only just print out on your own printer, but you can get large format posters made as well. And uh, those are now up and available on the website uh, on hubblesite.org, and the links to those are also in the description box. And finally, I want to remind you that the Ode to Hubble video contest. Will be the winner will be announced next week on Friday, a week from tomorrow. So look out if you're entered into that uh, contest. That'll be your big day. There'll be two winners selected: one from uh, the uh, the category of 25 and, uh, and under, and those older than 25. So take a look <laughs> for those. And I still love the prize. That, yeah. that prize is amazing. So for for those of you that entered or don't know about it, those that entered a video in there. You get a piece of the solar array that was taken down and when it was replaced and brought back down to Earth. So you get an actual piece of the Hubble Space Telescope uh, if you're a winner. So uh, good luck to those that made made it to the finalists. And uh, let me know your address because I might come by and steal it. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that person talking is Scott Lewis. You guys remember him. He joins me every week as the driver of the internet. But this week it's a little bit different. He has organized this really interesting hangout. So he is going to uh, uh, be talking a lot with the people out at Mount Wilson. Uh, so, but before he gets started, I want before you announce ever or introduce our guests, would you uh, tell people how they can interact with us, Scott? Yes. So the Best way for you to interact with us, as I'm already seeing people starting to do, is on the Q&A app here on YouTube and Google+. Hi, Sev, Dust Bunny. Is that, yeah, it is Sev. <laughs> Hi, Sev. <laughs> Uh, but what you can do there is if you're watching this embedded somewhere, if you're watching this on Google+, Plus or on YouTube, on the bottom left there'll be a link saying that we are answering questions. And it'll allow you to post questions. We'll be able to see them, select them, and answer them on air. So if you're not watching this live, you can actually jump to the questions that we're answering as we're answering them. Also, though I am typically doing this, I'm not today, but you please... Um, tweet with us at the Hubble hash, uh, the hashtag Hubble Hangout. I just pulled a Tony there. Um, I will not be actually doing the, the tweeting, but uh, Cindy here from the Carnegie, um, from Carnegie Astronomy will be doing that. So you'll be seeing tweets with that hashtag, and I put it down here in my lower third um, at uh, Carnegie Astro. So please follow them, and... Uh, live tweet any of your questions or, or comments coming up. I'll try to take a look at that if I can uh, switch through tabs as we're going through. But I'm going to leave that more to Tony since I am not an octopus. Yes. Uh, and I'll, also just I'll leave comments well on, on YouTube. I'll keep an eye on it too. So you better. Yeah. Better do it. So um, <laughs> real quick, so to be, with our introductions, we're actually at the Carnegie Observatory's office here in Pasadena which is uh, who owns the telescopes up at Mount Wilson. So we chose a warmer climate because it is a little chilly up at Mount Wilson. But uh, with me here is Nick. Uh, he is a Hello. senior docent up at Mount Wilson. And I am awful with pronouncing your last name. Uh, that's quite right. I have trouble with it myself. Do you? Uh, Arkimovich. Arkimovich. So but Nick, Nick Arkimovich. is fine. And he is a fantastic senior docent up there, gives a lot of the special tours. How long have you been up there? 
Uh, about 11 years now. I've 11 been years. Tours. Very nice. And and this guy over here, um, I mean, we just kind of added him in. He just happens to be the, the acting director of the Carnegie Observatory. Uh, and this is John, and again, horrible with names, John. Mulcahy. Mulcahy. John, Dr. John Mulcahy. Oh, man, that was a big fail, Scott, all around. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, That's okay. It's, I, live with, a Lewis. I live with Scott Lewis. <laughs> yeah, all right? yeah, okay, fair enough. Anything more than five letters, and I'm done. So... <laughs> I also so want to know how competitive you are. You had, you had to, uh, you had to go somewhere to, that would finally uh, do do my bookcases uh, to put my bookcases. I had to shame, man. That's, good. That's right. I think we have, um, we have Hale photobombing us as well, looking down <laughs> on us as we do some outreach. So, this what I really love about where we're at. Before we get into Edmund Hubble um, and and his legacy of the work he's done, is there. This is where a lot of history has happened, and there is a photo just over there of, of Einstein and Humison and, and, and Hubble and many other, St. John as well, where many talks have been given. This building was built in, what, 1902? So the campus was founded at that time, or the observatory itself, but the building is 1912. 1912. Yeah. So 103 years old, and I... I've been a kid in a candy store going through this place. It's been fantastic. And I just, I love all, all of what we're looking around here are actual academic journals. We have a couple journals here um, from Edwin Hubble that we will talk about a little bit later on in the show. But first, I, I want to get in uh, with Nick here. Hubble joined Mount Wilson when? When did he, he join us? He arrived in August of 1919. Uh, and there's actually a little bit of an interesting story to that. Uh, uh, Hubble studied astronomy at Yerkes, uh, and then when World War I, when U.S. joined World War I, he wanted to join with the Army. Um, and, and Hale had already kind of tapped Hubble to come and join Mount Wilson. Uh, and, and Hubble asked for special permission. Can, will the position still hold if I go off to war and fight? Uh, and he never really did fight. Uh, he, he never really saw action. No. But, uh, but he came, basically, when he was discharged he at, at the Presidio in San Francisco, and then he came down here in August of 1919 and joined the Mount Wilson Observatory. That, that, you know, that's kind of nice. So I just, I'm, just got back from war. What am I going to do next? <laughs> hmm, let's see. There, I think I should do I'll some discover stuff. other galaxies, maybe. Yeah, right. let, let, let's, let's <laughs> see what I can do now that I've gone to war. Well, he's what, came back a major? Uh, yes. Came back a major, go to war, come back a major, decide, hey, I, I'm going to blow your minds with astronomy. That, that's right. what he did. And, and it's worth pointing out that he was initially a lawyer. That's what he was going to be because his dad, he had promised his dad that he would be a lawyer, and then when his dad died, he got to his real passion, which was astronomy. So he actually went back to school See, to become an astronomer. Th that's good because we all love lawyers, don't we? <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's great that he decided that we should like him a little bit better for doing some amazing things. So um, I, real quick, since I, you know, I've been here, I've been able to go through some of the archives. And um, Elena, I, I shared a picture of you uh, of the moon, um, which is taken a little bit after when Hubble arrived. And this was actually a glass plate that I was able to do some imaging on. And so everything that was done at the time, and this is taken from the 100-inch Hooker telescope, that is what Hubble used, as well as many other telescopes up at Mount Wilson. But this is one, you know, this is a pretty early on image from the 100-inch telescope, and this is the year that Hubble arrived. And just the astounding beauty of, like, yeah, we see the moon all the time. It's a lot really easy now, especially with amateur astronomy, but looking at it through a 100-inch primary mirror onto a piece of glass is just, it just blew my mind. So I, I really loved how this image was able to come out. And this is, this is the beginning of Hubble at Mount Wilson. So I, I know you, you know a little bit more about his, you know, as he got started there. He didn't get started on the 60 inch or the 100 inch. No, he did, in fact. Did he? He did. Uh, his first plates were taken uh, on the 60 inch. Uh, I, I forgot the exact date. I have it in my notes. But, but he started with the 60 inch. In fact, in the 60 inch telescope, uh, there's a, a wall of lockers uh, on the ground yeah. floor, and Hubble's name is on one of the lockers. 
I have that on my phone. I was just up there, and I took a picture of it. Um, I, I thought he had a, a smaller dome there for a while, or did he still work in that, the one that Tom uses every once in a while? Uh, possibly. Okay. Uh, I, I can't speak with any authority. I know that that, that dome housed um, a 6-inch Alvin Clark refractor for a while, but... but Telescopes have changed in that particular dome. The 60-inch and the 100-inch, we haven't shuffled those telescopes around much. No, no. They're, they're, they're not easy to move around, uh, from what I've heard and seen. Uh, as it's of late. important to note also that this was ground zero. This was the premier place that astronomy was done, right? I mean, when it was when the when the 100-inch uh, was commissioned, there was no better telescope on the planet. Is, is was there? Right. Those were the biggest telescopes in the world. Uh, that when Hale came here. At the turn of the last century, he convinced Carnegie to help fund uh, Mount Wilson, and the goal of that was to really have the biggest telescopes in the world, and the 60-inch and then the 100-inch, and eventually folks here at Carnegie built the Palomar 200-inch with folks at Caltech down near San Diego, and those were really the three biggest telescopes in the world at the time, and that, and that allowed Hubble and other astronomers to really uh, do the remarkable things they did. So Hubble decides that he wants to be an astronomer from going from a, being a lawyer and how is it that he gets access to the single, the most powerful telescopes of the day? Was it, was, did he have a reputation? Was he, did he, you know, he, because he just, he was brand new as, in his career as an astronomer, right? Well, yes and no. I mean, remember, he went to Yerkes to study astronomy. Now, Yerkes uh, is at the University of Chicago, right? We should point correct. that out. And that's, yeah, that's a 20-inch refractor, correct? No, a 40-inch refractor. 40-inch refractor. And it was exactly. the largest refractor. It still is the largest refractor. It's the largest world. refractor in the world to, to That's right. And, and to clarify, for for the, so a refracting telescope is actually one with a lens on it, and not, so it's refracting the light going through as opposed to the, those that are up at Mount Wilson, the 60-inch and 100-inch, which are reflecting telescopes, and they use mirrors that are collimated. But I, I don't know the exact answer to that question, but, but Hale actually came from the University of Chicago to, to found the Carnegie Observatories here in Pasadena and Mount Wilson. So I think he probably had a very strong connection with the University of Chicago, which was extremely good in astronomy at the time. And so my guess is when Hubble came out, he, he came with a reputation from a place that, that Hale really trusted. Yes, okay. and, and just to clarify something else, we mentioned Hale's three large telescopes. He actually built the world's largest consecutively four times because he's responsible for the Yerkes refractor. True. That was his baby. Uh, it's just that he realized... Good job, Hale. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he realized that refractors had run their course. Yeah, there's a limit to how big refractors can be in a That's practical cool. sense because you've got to have a really big, nice, perfect piece of glass to make a refractor out of. Whereas with mirrors, you can do all kinds of interesting things. As we, right. As and we there's, and there's a really cool story about the mirrors too. So the the 60 inch was was poured. That's uh, correct. One major pour. And what was it made out of? Uh, it, regular glass. So it, it's actually it's wine bottle glass. Wine it was bottle. poured in France. Uh, this is before Pyrex and before they started waffling the backs of mirrors. So it's just a solid piece of glass. It's about nine inches thick and 60 inches in diameter. And that that blank was actually William Hale's uh, last gift to his son, George Ellery Hale. It was a birthday gift. You know, here you go, son, glass blank, you make it into a telescope. Very cool. And then the 100-inch... Uh, was done the same way. However, the oh, was it the, the cauldrons there? They they weren't able to pour enough glass to to make a 101 inch diameter, right? That's exactly correct. I, I believe they were melting at the same time. They had three different cauldrons. They had the mold built, uh, but they didn't have a cauldron large enough to just do one pour. So they they had to pour from three pre-melted. Now they were already pre-melted, but even just a couple of minutes it takes to shift positions, the glass had started to, to solidify somewhat, and so air bubbles were created when the next pour went in. And so it kind of came out like a three-layer cake. Three-layer three cake of astronomy. Yep. And, <laughs> and so, you know, th this is showing us, you know, where the, the instruments that were coming from. So when, when Hubble was up there, he obviously wasn't by himself. There were many other people there. Um, and I, I, I've always found the the history of of Humison being you know that he would start off as a janitor. That's correct. And ended up helping him 
discover many amazing things up there. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure that Hummerson was really good with Spectra. Uh, yes, well, I guess Hummerson's major talent, uh, more than anything else, is he was a quick study and he was comfortable with mechanical things. Uh, he actually started not as a janitor, but he was the, one of the mule drivers that was bringing up the stuff to build the observatory. Wow. And then he liked the mountaintop so much, he, he dropped out of school. He's a middle school dropout, I believe, and, uh, and, and he wanted to stay there, and that's how he got the job as first, like, as a busboy at the hotel nearby, and then uh, eventually became a janitor, and, and then someone suggested, he was hanging around at night a lot, and someone suggested, well, maybe you want to be, like, a night assistant, and so he moved up through the ranks, but never through academia. Never through academia, so it, it, you can start as a janitor, it's okay. Um, <laughs> You know, last century, maybe. Yeah, it doesn't happen so much anymore. Not so much anymore. I'm trying it. You are. Hey, <laughs> there you go. I, I mean, I've been hanging here. out. <laughs> <laughs> so, with with everything he's done there, what are some of his contributions there? I mean, we all know, you know or a lot of us know about the, his major accomplishments, but has, did he have any minor accomplishments leading up to... You know, to Andromeda. Uh, I don't know. Four ma four major accomplishments is not enough. I mean, there. You know, I'd be, I be. I always argue, as as you will, that probably that the biggest accomplishment in his career was showing that the universe was really a universe and not just a Milky Way galaxy. Right. 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 Showing the distance of Andromeda. I mean, I think to me that's a fundamental change in our understanding of the universe, and I argue it's the most important scientific result in 400 and years. And uh, I, I, we should pull out that paper. But yeah. Not everybody will agree with that. Other folks will argue that his biggest accomplishment is the discovery of the expanding universe, which is pretty significant as well. So here, um, actually pulled off from right over there, this is the actual paper, and I'm sure you can't see the text, but I will put it up on Twitter <laughs> and Instagram later. It's saturated. Uh, it's completely blank in the blinding light right now. Yeah. But uh, this is a spiral nebula as a stellar system, Messier 31. And this is from 1929. And it's just, to me, I mean, you can find this online. Uh, you can find digital copies of it. But being able to hold this, you know, very old 1929 journal. And there's another one here from uh, 25. Oh, this, this is the one with the actual discovery. This, by 1929 was the, um, the expansion. This is the one you were just discussing, actually, the 1925. And, and so, you know, being here and, and being able to see that he made different discoveries, whether you agree that his major one is that it's expanding, or the fact that the Milky Way isn't our universe, but that there are billions, well, not at the time, we didn't know there were billions of other ones. Hubble Space Telescope helped with that. Yeah. But, um, but that... It, the you know the great nebula in Andromeda was actually a completely different galaxy, and I and think that, it's important to illustrate that point to drive that home. Prior to this, prior to this discovery, we did not know there were other galaxies in the universe. We simply we we didn't know it, it, we we thought the, that the Milky Way was it, and Edwin Hubble definitively proved using the discoveries of observations of C-field variables that this was in fact. Uh, not the case. We there's galaxies all over the place. That that blows me away. That's only a hundred years ago or so. Right. So and exactly. Um, and Elena, there's the the third image I sent you is, is one of those um, images that you know he was using and studying at the time. Yeah. What are we looking at here? Describe this. Uh, sorry, is that that's our image right yeah. there. Yeah. Yep. This is our image right this here. This is one of the plates of the Andromeda galaxy, and he circled. It's hard for me to see from the assistance, but he circled locations of, of ver these variable stars. Here, I'll make a bigger version. Uh, that, that helps a lot, yeah. So you see he's, he's noted on the plate himself where uh, these stars that he's discovered are variables that allow one to calculate the distance to the object. Uh, and in this case, he used this to show that Andromeda was much, much further away than anything in the Milky Way. Okay, let's talk about how, they, how that can be done. How are these variables used as yardsticks? Okay, well, they're, they're known at what we call standard candles. In this particular case, this class of object varies in a very regular way. And the, the time scale for the variation is actually correlated directly with the amount of energy or the luminosity the object puts out. And so what you can do is if you can watch them over time and see how they vary, determine the scale of the variation, you can then directly correlate that with how much energy they're putting out. 
And so so saying, ahead, let me just say that a little slightly different way. So these yeah. stars get bright and dim and bright and dim in a right. certain frequency or a certain period, and yes. that is re that is directly related to how bright the star really is. If you that's were, right. and that's important because if you know something, how bright something is intrinsically, how bright it would be if it were right next to you. Then when you move it away, far away, because the brightness goes down, it's the inverse of the uh, square of the. Uh, inverse square law, then you can calculate how far away something is. And That's right. it's an incredibly important uh, yardstick, and astronomers use it to this day. And it, and it should be noted, too, that that's not what, you know, Hubble didn't discover Cepheid variables. He's no. using that. Uh, right. Henry, Henrietta Leavitt, uh, which is a, another brilliant astronomer, so... Why doesn't she have a space telescope named after her? She should too. I, 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 <laughs> should. I, agree. I, I, yes, I agree totally agree. So maybe the next one. <laughs> you know, maybe we'll, uh, we'll talk with some people and have the successor to Webb be the Levitt. Telescope. Yeah, maybe maybe W first could be called. <laughs> I totally agree. I'll I'll start a petition because I yeah, I agree yeah. that is a great idea because using her research on on the Cepheid variables. Without that, he, he might have, okay, this is another system of stars outside of her Milky Way, but not have anything else to say about it besides that they're, it's far away. That's it's right. Outside. But without her research, that's, you know, that's when we're able to see that it's not only far away, but then later on seeing that it's redshifting, you, you know, so the Doppler effect, and seeing that it's actually moving away from us and that everything else is moving away from us. Yeah, yeah, so you go. that's right. So looking, getting back to this image, you say you say he circled some of the variables that he thought, were, or the, some some of the stars that he thought were variables, and he yes. measured their distance, and dis and and he discovered they were. I mean, what what was the big uh, what was the big discovery here that they were they were farther away than they could possibly be if they were inside of our galaxy? Yes, I mean, basically, what he found was that it was it was much at that time people had a good idea of what the somewhat good idea of what the size of the Milky Way galaxy was, and this calculation showed that this was much further away. Andromeda had to be much further away than the Milky Way was, and so it really the natural conclusion there was that it was a separate system. Uh, it turns out that Hubble actually had the scaling wrong. Uh, he thought Andromeda was actually much closer than it really is, and that's because there's multiple types of these Cepheid variable stars. And he was observing the, the, a different kind than he realized, and so they have a different calibration scale. Um, but uh, but he still reached the right conclusion. Uh, it's, it, I should also point out that, uh, and I don't know if we have the other image, the original image. Do we have the original variable image? It's not one you would have seen directly, but uh, it's the famous one. I, I have um, a picture of it. It's, uh, yeah, if you have a, it's just it's a very exciting because uh, he was not really looking for this. He actually was mostly studying other sorts of variable stars, things called nova. Uh, and when he realized that he had found a Cepheid variable, he wrote VAR with an exclamation point on the plate. It's really quite spectacular. Don't do don't do you have a copy of that? We're yeah, sure. let me, let we're me see if we can find one for you. Let uh, me pull it up. It's in my email. I need to re-download it. Oh, okay. okay so we'll get to it. But um, uh, yeah, it's, that, it's pretty, pretty interesting. Cool. He actually wrote it in nail nail uh, fingernail polish. Uh, in, in like a bright red uh, color, and it's really quite spectacular. <laughs> Uh, but he was very excited because he realized right away that he had found something uh, something remarkable. So I have a practical question about the telescope that Hubble was using at the time. What uh, were were there any filters um, on these on on the on the telescopes or or was it all just done in, in white light? Nick could probably answer that. Yeah, in those days it was pretty much white light. I mean, they they probably had some compensating they had to do. Photographic emulsions changed around that time also. Uh, so plates were, were more sensitive to more colors. Uh, so they may have used filters a little bit for that reason, uh, but, but we are still talking about the visible spectrum. We're not going outside of that into anything like radio, infrared, or anything like that. Okay. Uh, got it here. I'm just downloading it real quick yeah, so we're I can share it out. So everybody, it's Okay. It is amazing. It is. It, it 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 has been argued by many, including myself, that this is the most valuable photographic plate ever taken, in terms of its uh, once again uh, what it really it really redefined our our observation and understanding of the universe. Okay, so describe this. 
just justify yourself. Why do you think that? <laughs> justify well, yeah. yourself. Well, well, what I'll what I'll argue is that when you know when Copernicus realized that the sun was at the center of the solar system, that really revolutionized our understanding of our place in the universe. Right? Yeah. Everybody thought it was everything was the Earth. The Earth was the center of everything. And at the time when at Hubble's time, most people thought that the universe was basically the Milky Way galaxy. And um, once again, it was kind of we were in a special place. And and I think what Hubble showed when he showed that this this nebula, as he called it, uh, Andromeda, was actually a separate system similar to the Milky Way. It really meant that the Milky Way was just one of, as we now know, billions of, of galaxies. And so it really showed that, once again, we're not necessarily in a very special place uh, in, in the universe. So it really revolutionized I, our idea of the universe. And you see where he's marked N near some of those things. Those are these nova that he was looking at. And at the top, you'll see there's a thing where it says VAR in red. Mm -hmm. People can see that, I think, right? Yep. Uh, and the N is crossed out. That's because he had previously, in an image from two nights before, I think it was, right, the previous plate, he had thought he found one of these nova, which they get brighter, and then they fade. And then he realized at this op with this observation that, in fact, it wasn't a nova, but it was really the, one of these Cepheid variable stars. So you can see his excitement with the exclamation right. point right on the plate. Um, <laughs> And there's actually a, a lot of history with. I mean, this plate. There's there's many papers written on this on this historic plate because it really it really was such an important discovery. Yeah. So I personally argue that this was Hubble's most important discovery, but there were many others, as I said, especially the expanding universe that I think could questionably be uh, of this almost the same caliber in terms of importance. Yeah, only because I, I I'm more predisposed to that. I'm, I t I tend to think the expanding universe uh, idea was was. Uh, was was bigger, but only marginally so. <laughs> I yeah, think they're the twin universe was getting bigger, Tony. That, that's <laughs> All the time. Bigger to... <laughs> and then we found out in the '90s that it was even accelerating. Yeah, but he right. didn't know that. At the time. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Well, I will. Uh, let me just comment on one thing. That another very important thing that's related to the Hubble Space Telescope, particularly, is one of Hubble's other things he did was he classified the morphologies of the shapes of these galaxies, right? And he really, he had what we call the Hubble sequence, where he showed there were these early type galaxies, we now refer to mostly as ellipticals, and then he showed spiral galaxies of different sorts. And, and this is, of course, something that the Hubble Space Telescope has had a huge legacy in, and you can see uh, his classification scheme there. Mm -hmm. So that classification scheme was based on, on low redshift galaxies. And of course, what Hubble is allowing us to do is to look at these things at very high redshift now, and try to understand uh, understand these galaxies in more detail. How do you get these various sorts of galaxies? And that that is really why I think naming the telescope after him. There were many reasons, but uh, you know, I mean, what one thing Hubble has done just brilliantly is, of course, image objects at over time, and and this is really something that Hubble really started this technique. So that's a third thing he did. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the first two were not important enough. <laughs> you know, just you know, just in case. You know, so he yeah. decided to not be a lawyer. Thank you. Uh, come back a major, <laughs> and then just go ahead and blow our minds time and time again with some, you know, with some brilliant science, changing the way that our species understands where we are in the universe. And I mean, I like to say that I do that, but I I can't actually <laughs> say that I do that. But there are a few people that, and I would say Edwin Hubble is one, and again, Henry, Henrietta Leavitt, you know, without that research, that would not have been able to be done. Uh, a lot of his research that was came from that. And, and, and something that we've talked about in the past with, with Hubble Hangouts is that we are working on the shoulders of giants, and it's all about using and working together with previous research and having a better understanding of the universe as we're going along. And that's, you can kind of see that, that stepping, you know, going first, okay, well, now we're seeing it's outside of our Milky Way. Okay, well, now we're seeing that it, you know, we can actually measure how far away, and we're actually seeing that it's moving away from us. So we're seeing these incremental steps that are happening in the early 20th century, and then we've just been able to plunge past now that we're able to have you know, space telescopes like the Hubble Space Telescope. Yep. So, uh, Sev Dustbunny's given us a nice comment. I'll, I'll just read it real quick. He says yeah. that given the quality of the image Hubble was working with, I'm sure he would be more blown away than we are now with the HST high-resolution images of Andromeda. As, 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 this, as this is so much more, as many can get far better images with their own home telescopes the, these days. And that's true. I mean, could you imagine what he would have thought if he had seen these space telescope images of the Andromeda galaxy? That would have been... Right. <laughs> that would have blown him away. 
<laughs> that would have blown him away. I'm very confused. Why is that telescope named after me? Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> no, I, I don't know. I would have I'm looking for myself. That. He was he was a man yeah. with a little bit of an ego. Let's let's just say, but well deserved. Well, yeah, he had a lot of accomplishment. <laughs> but then, like, you're able to get these in color. What what's going on with that? Yeah. And I I also think that he'd be just you know obviously speculating, but having the Hubble Ultra Deep Field or the extreme deep mm-hmm. field, and the fact that, okay, so you, you discovered this galaxy that's really close to us, but let's look at close to the edge of the observable universe, and we're still seeing galaxies. That's right. That's right. And Frontier that Fields is, is doing it even six more times. So Six more times, yeah. right. I want to I want to ask more. I want to go back to what you talked about with with Hubble's personality in just a minute. But before I do, I want to ask you about go back to the discovery of uh, the fact that in, that uh, the Andromeda was actually a galaxy. Uh, was there did he meet any resistance to, to whether was there anybody uh, resistant to the idea or was it pretty well accepted when when he uh, made the discovery? Did anybody? I, think, I don't know. Do you want to answer this, Nick? Or? I, I I could take a shot yeah. at this. To begin with, we have to remember that, that Hubble didn't like discover galaxies. The truth is that was in debate. Uh, astronomers at Lick were arguing, uh, uh, Keeler and Curtis were already arguing that these spiral nebulae were galaxies, were separate island universes, but they were the ones who were meeting with resistance more than anything. I so, see. Uh, in answer to your question, I would say it's not so much that Hubble met with resistance, it's that he actually squashed the resistance. He right. settled the question that had been brewing, where 50% of astronomers thought, no, 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 Milky Way is everything, and another 50% said, no, no, these spiral nebulae are actually other island universes. Was Palomar the only telescope available to make that could have made these observations, or could other people follow up with other telescopes after he did this, measure these variables? Yeah, but these were at Matt Wilson, first of all. Palomar didn't quite exist. I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Uh, um, yeah, um, <laughs> but no, the astronomers at Lick, for instance, could have done could have done similar sort of, of measurements. The other really interesting thing is when you go back and look at these papers, Hubble was pretty cautious, actually. He published these variable stars uh, in the earlier paper that Nick was talking about, but he doesn't jump right away to the conclusion that they're necessarily at that distance. It was actually, if you read it, the, the second paper, is actually the one where where he comes out and says, okay, it must be a separate thing. And he's pretty cautious, and I, I think it. He, so I mean, I think he understood that there was a pretty big debate here, even though he was very excited about it. And I believe right. in, in this one here, there was he was actually plotting. Yeah. Um, I don't know if it's in this one. Start with page one hundred three. Where are we? At? This is. Just, there we go. In that one. It might be yours. No, it's mine. It's yeah, that one. Right. Yeah. So. In here, and again, I'll, we'll put a, pic, a picture of it later. But um, he was, you know, just large data sets are being published in this, as well as if I can find it because this is just so much great science that's in here. Um, but I might be able to. I might be able to. Oh yeah, they're fine. Yeah, yeah. So. I don't know if you guys can see that. No, it's all washed out. We could, I could see some smudges, but uh, yeah. Well, so I'll take pictures of this later and put up on Twitter. Just, yeah. But uh, you know, he he's plotting and, and seeing the light curves of the sepiates that are going on, and it just blows me away. On you know, in the in the early 20th century, we're able to do this, and it completely transforms the way that we view everything. So tell us a little bit about. Hubble the man now. What sort of a what sort of a man was he? What was his personality like? Well, I I think the short story is that Hubble did not suffer from a deficiency of ego. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that's the first thing. <laughs> he, he, uh, it, it's really hard to even know a lot of the early stuff about his early life because Hubble had a habit of kind of reinventing himself. And and one classic way to prove that he reinvented himself, I mean, um, is that that he was born in Marshfield, Missouri, uh, and he grew up in the Midwest, and then he got a Rhodes scholarship and went to Oxford uh, to study law, and he came back with a British accent. <laughs> <laughs> he used it for the rest of his life. Uh, it was crazy, because Harlow Shapley was also from Missouri, and he couldn't understand why this man that they, they grew up. You know, within miles of each other, and and yet this guy here is speaking with a British accent. Uh, <laughs> that sounds a little aloof, but that's really a part of Hubble liked to reinvent himself. 
Uh, he was always very cautious about any discussion about his military service because uh, he wanted to be a man of action and uh, you really probe deep enough you find out he never really saw combat. Uh, <laughs> but you know he liked to be referred to as Major Hubble. Oh really? I didn't know that. That's yeah. interesting. <laughs> okay. <laughs> We should probably mention that you know, almost every photograph you see of him, he's just he's never smiling. He's very except with the photographs of him and his cat. Yes, Hub, do we oh, have yeah, that which, one? Yeah. Well, I have it on my phone. Oh, we'll have to put that, um, show people that. It's a great so I'll, photo. I'll tweet that out here in a second. Okay. Uh, but yes, I, I do have the the picture of, of Hubble with his cat, and it is I wouldn't even call it a smile. Yes, honestly. it's a smirk. I would say. It, it's, <laughs> it's it's kind of like I've got a cat. <laughs> but the funny thing about it is he named his cat uh, Nicholas Copernicus, which if you once again gets back to, in my opinion, his ego. I mean, he named it after the other guy that had cha changed our vision of the universe. <laughs> I don't know if that was intentional or he, he but it, it's an interesting choice to pick the other guy who, who he had kind of followed up on in some sense. So uh, I'm tweeting this out right now. And you, you, you must know some stories of the cat, do you? Uh, well, the first thing I need to clarify is the cat came much later. Yes. Uh, b because uh, I think the cat came about six years before Hubble died. Uh, and the cat continued to live after Hubble died. Uh, the cat moped for Hubble. That's what I've heard, uh, too. Yeah. So, <laughs> but, but, yeah, so the cat is a, a much later. I think he got married well before the cat. Hmm. Uh, wife first, cat second. Ah, okay. So, and, and, and he was also, I guess we should say, he was he was a bit of a celebrity. Um, he was on the cover of Time magazine uh, after the, after the expanding universe discovery, uh, and he hung out with a lot of of Hollywood types. Uh, it was pretty. And well he known. gave personal tours of Mount Wilson to the likes of like Charlie Chaplin, for instance, uh, and Aldous Huxley. Yep. So yeah, sweet. That would be awesome. That he didn't shy away from attention. So, would you say that he helped you know bring in a brave new world? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> but he, he, he did help bring attention to astronomy, which is a good thing. Yeah. And certainly one could argue that the Hubble Space Telescope has done that better than anybody, right? I That's mean, right. That's Hubble insane. over the last 25 years has really... Everybody knows the Hubble Space Telescope. Everybody knows Edwin Hubble because of the Hubble Space Telescope. I don't think there's a more appropriately named instrument uh, right. out there. I yeah. think I think you're absolutely right. Um, so let's let, let me ask you about the uh, expanding universe uh, discovery. The fact that uh, the galaxies uh, mo are all moving away from one another. He was one of the first to notice that with by measuring their redshifts, and. Uh, he met Einstein, if I'm not mistaken, and mm -hmm. and uh, and, I, and Einstein was really blown away about you know with that discovery, uh, so much so that he actually made some corrections to his relative rel theory of I think it's the general theory of relativity. He made uh, corrections to based on this observations. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, uh, do I? Uh, yeah, sure, I can do it. Um, what I, the interesting thing is Einstein had earlier predicted that you had a universe that either was expanding or, or would eventually collapse on itself. And then he had called this his biggest blunder because he had decided at some point that the universe was very static. And so when Hubble's discovery of the expanding universe came out, Hubble actually re uh, Einstein actually realized that he was in fact right before. Yeah. Uh, and so he kind of basically revised what, what he had already kind of stated early on. And so he, he was very fascinated by the expanding universe. And Einstein spent a lot of time here at Carnegie Observatories. He went to Mount Wilson uh, right here. And we have pictures here. Yep, uh, I'm tweeting out that picture you, right I, now. You're yeah. going to see a picture. I can still tweet. I don't know <laughs> how, but I can. We're talking. <laughs> but uh, there, there's a great picture you're going to see in a few, a few seconds uh, of Einstein when he gave a lecture. Right, standing right here, you'll see the same photograph of Hale in the background. Uh, giving a lecture on his models because of this excitement he got from Hubble. I mean, so Hubble really, with the expanding universe discovery, really set off the field of cosmology, that is, you know, how the universe changes and evolves and such, uh, which, of course, once again, the Hubble Space Telescope has had a huge role in. And so I would argue that, that, that the expanding universe really was the, the start of probably cosmology. Yeah. I would agree. I would agree with that, too. All of this is happening so fast. I mean, what were the... What was the... Um, the 
the time scale between these these observations of you know and these, Andromeda these were versus, all in the same decade, actually less than a decade. Right. Those, so the, those two it's, results. It's remarkable. The twenties yeah. were a very good time for Edwin Hubble. They were. And, they were. <laughs> he was just roaring with astronomy. It was up the there roaring twenties. Well, yeah. and what's interesting is that's also a big time for particle physics too, right? I mean, there's a lot of people like Niels Bohr and, and Einstein and and Fermi. All these guys are working really hard, and discoveries are being made uh, in 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 all areas of physics during this time. So it was, it's in a remarkable period in our history and, and for the history of science, I think. Um, so did did uh, did Hubble ever? I don't know. Did he ever? You mentioned he had a pretty strong personality. What was his relationship with Einstein like? Were they just colleagues? Were they were they friends? Did they have any 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 rivalries or anything like that? No, I mean, I think I think it was really more of a uh, of, of an interesting. I wouldn't. It's not even a collaboration. I mean, I think I think obviously everybody knew who Einstein was, and Hubble was thrilled that Einstein thought. Uh, enough of him to come and spend time with him. I mean, so Einstein spent, uh, my understanding is, he, he was in Pasadena quite a bit at that time. He was uh, debating coming here uh, on a longer term basis and that ended up not happening. But I, I'm sure that Hubble really enjoyed the fact that Einstein, of all people, found him interesting because Einstein was a famous guy at that time. So I, I suspect their relationship it was a one of, of admiration on both sides. And though I, I did just tweet at the picture that's in here, I know there is a photograph up at the uh, the monastery, yeah, with uh, with you know Einstein sitting down in a chair, and I, I heard that that picture was retaken, so so Dr. Hubble could move a little bit closer to <laughs> Einstein. <laughs> um, that's that's extremely possible. Actually, if you, if you look at at pictures of Einstein with Hubble there, it it gets kind of amusing because very often Hubble's kind of leaning in a little closer with his pipe. And getting you know a little closer to it's Einstein. It's all right. <laughs> we we can get close here. That's fine. And, 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 and the reason is because in those days, you know, the, the reporters were using like a four by five speed Graflex, and they were composing loosely. And Hubble, I think, understood that he could end up getting cropped out of the picture, <laughs> and he knew that that Einstein was the focus of the picture, and he wanted to make sure that he's as close as possible to Einstein so that you can't crop him out. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, that's great. I just retweeted yeah. some of uh, Scott's tweets, so if you're following Hubble Telescope, you'll see them there also. And also, don't forget the Hubble Hangout hashtag. Uh, if, you're, if you're following that, you'll see it also. Thanks, Scott, for doing that. Yeah, um, no problem. Yeah, so... Uh, like I said, I've been geeking out here, so I have a lot of photos that I will be sharing out later on um, throughout time. Plus, like I said, the, the images that Elaine has been sharing... Those are those are photographs I've taken that were on a a, a light plate on a light pan panel. And I took raw uh, raw shots with my DSLR and then did some processing. So these are actual plates, and we actually have some plates here, which I think is would be yeah, awesome to show off to everybody. Some, I shouldn't theory put that on, but so I'm I'm reading us uh, because I will. If I'm not, I don't know. If, I don't know if people he, can see. He can, you can get in trouble. I can't. Yeah. Uh, uh, you want to just get right up to the camera if you'd like. See, yeah. You so can what, see what it looks like. I can't see it because it's blocking it. But. Yeah, I don't know if this is an example of one of the photographic plates of Andromeda. Here, people can see it. Turn on yeah, the we flashlight. Yeah, we're, we're gonna get. Uh, we're gonna try something. I don't know if that helps. Probably uh, not. No, no that, that, just, that just saturates it. That That's better. That's better. Putting, it's better, so you can see yeah, it now. Yeah, yeah, that's. I'm a photographer. So Excellent. these are these are. I mean, let's talk a little bit about the fact that the stars are black and space is white. Why do, why do why is there a negative image of these galaxies? Why don't, why not just the way things because were? They're, they're negative. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Be, because back before we had camera phones and, and CCDs and CMOS, is when you did photography, you received negatives, and then you had to develop them into positives. So I had. Well, to what I was trying positives. to get you to say, what I was trying to get you to say was, I know they're negatives, but I was trying to get you to talk about the fact that these, the it's easier to make these observations, these measurements with with uh, a negative format than it is with white stars on a black background. That's what I was trying to get you to say. Oh, that's, well, that's true. Can, we have a chat window. You can tell us these things. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but yeah it's coming out. No, that's all right. It's, it's not a hangout if that doesn't happen at least once. That's so. true. That's, <laughs> that's, why, that's what we have. But yeah, and, and it's true. And it's what it, it's doing there. It's interacting with chemicals there, and the photons are hitting it, and it's causing a chemical reaction that's that's on these glass plates, and then they go through development, and which is when they're reversed, or where they're invert, the colors are inverted, or just the light's inverted, 
Uh, so you see space is black and the stars is white, and you're able to see the luminosities. Uh, but it wasn't just images. The spectra was also being taken, correct? How, how was spectra taken? Uh, I'm going to let you answer that, John. Well, no, I mean, it's a similar sort of technique. They were detected on the same sort of plates. Right. Um, you just put a, a spectrograph that actually splits the light up, divides the light by its wavelength that could be analyzed. And so Hubble used that, for instance, to find the expanded universe because he had to measure the the red shifts of the objects by seeing how the lines had moved. So, uh, but it's, it was a bit, the detectors were always these, pretty much these photographic plates until the mid 80s, 1980s, that is, when we uh, moved over to digital technology, which we all have on our phone now. Right. Yeah. I think uh, back in the day, the, a big CCD was considered, uh, you know, 500 pixels square or something like that. It was. Uh, oh, even smaller than that. I think I, I'm, I'm going to age myself here, but I, I think I worked on 256 by 256. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. When I, I actually built one that was 256 by 128. It was a homemade uh, cookbook CCD camera, they were called. And uh, you could you could buy a Texas Instruments chip, and it came with plans, and you put it all together. And I built it when I was in uh, when I was in college. It was a. Uh, and now those are the the size of the hazard cams on the Curiosity rover, tiny little cameras that they just put on there just to make sure there's nothing in the way. <laughs> and but this was groundbreaking at the time. And it's it's revolutionized. This is what we're using on the Hubble Space Telescope. We're using CCDs, which massive, you know, amounts of them, so we can take these enormous images. Well, and the efficiency of CCDs is is really high. This is the thing that allows you to get so sensitive. I mean, the Hubble Space Telescope is, of course, not a big telescope. It's the size of the hundred inch, right? That's so, right. And another poor uh, character. A little smaller. Yeah. What's that? And another important characteristic of CCDs is that they can be calibrated such that the numbers in each pixel actually mean something. They're in units of something that can be that's actually measurable. So that's something that's very difficult to get from a photograph uh, for photographic film because they, I believe, they react in a logarithmic way or some. They don't have a linear response to uh, the number of photons that fall on it, so it's easier to make measurements. I'm reading. Um, I'm, I want to get to some social media comments here. I'm reading Twitter. Erhan Guven uh, has tweeted um, that uh, uh, he never got a Nobel. He made a comment, but not a Nobel Prize. Astronomy yes, was so. not physics back then. So uh, we're going back to our conversation of uh, you know the the golden age of physics. I guess it was or a golden age of physics. Uh, Hubble never got a Nobel Prize, did he? No, but he would have. Um, he died too early is the problem, I think. Uh, he, he actually made a bit of a fuss about the fact that astronomers were not really eligible for Nobel Prizes at the time. Um, and that's oh, I, didn't, I did not know that. I didn't really. Yeah, so that was the reason why. And, and that actually changed right around the time he died. And in fact, but they don't give a Nobel Prize to somebody who's dead. And so uh, Hubble actually, right when the change was happening, if he had lived a few more years, he almost certainly would have gotten the Nobel Prize. The question is for what? Probably for the expanding universe, I guess. I would. I, I don't know. I, Who knows? But yeah, I mean it. Uh, but he he was aware of this, and this was a problem for him. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm sure he was a really nice guy. I know he's not coming across very well here. Uh, but uh, but uh, he he definitely made a fuss about this. There was no question that he he thought he that Einstein had one. He should, certainly should have one. <laughs> yeah. Einstein would agree he should have one too. <laughs> So uh, Sev Dustbunny is uh, asking again, um, knowing a bit about processing of negatives, et cetera, was this an expensive process in the time of Hubble, given the silver, et cetera, and not other and other not cheap chemicals involved? So w w was it expensive to make these plates? Was it an I think I can answer that. Uh, no. Not really. I mean, you had amateur photographers, you know, people taking snapshots. Uh, film was available. Of course, these were on glass plates. And, and one of the reasons to put these, even though film had moved on to acetate, which is more flexible and easier to look, make into roll film and have inside uh, portable cameras for snapshots, uh, glass plates are going to be more stable and accurate to do measurements on. So they continue to do, to, to do you know, glass plates for astronomy, and for would, scientific purposes. Would a part of that be because of temperature differentials? So glass isn't going to... It's not going to warp as much. It's, it's, it it's lays very flat, of course. Well, but, obviously, you've had these for a long time, the photographic plates. You've been showing them, and, and you're handling them right now. Are you guys... Do you have to store them in any kind of special way? Are you concerned at all about their degrading over time, or is that... Well, they, they in fact, do degrade a little bit over time. One of the things we've done at, here at Carnegie... 
they can interact with us, Scott? Yes. So the best way for you to interact with us, as I'm already seeing people starting to do, is on the Q&A app here on YouTube and Google+. Hi, Sev. Das Bunny. Is that, it is Sev. Hi, Sev. <laughs> Uh, but what you can do there is if you're watching this embedded somewhere, if you're watching this on Google+, Plus or on YouTube, on the bottom left there will be a link saying that we are answering questions, and it will allow you to post questions. We'll be able to see them, select them, and answer them on air. So if you're not watching this live, you can actually jump to the questions that we're answering as we're answering them. Also, though I am typically doing this, I'm not today, but you please... Um, tweet with us at the Hubble hash, uh, the hashtag Hubble Hangout. I just pulled a Tony there. Um, I will not be actually doing the, the tweeting, but uh, Cindy here from the Carnegie, um, from Carnegie Astronomy will be doing that. So you'll be seeing tweets with that hashtag, and I put it down here in my lower third um, at uh, Carnegie Astro. So please follow them, and... Uh, live tweet any of your questions or, or comments coming up. I'll try to take a look at that if I can uh, switch through tabs as we're going through. But I'm going to leave that more to Tony since I am not an octopus. Yes. Yeah, so uh, and I'll, also just I'll leave comments an while I'm on, on YouTube. I'll keep an eye on it too. So you Better. Yeah. Yes, as well. Yeah. Looking down on us as we do some outreach. So... This, what I really love about where we're at before we get into Edmund Hubble um, and, and his legacy of the work he's done, is there. this is where a lot of history has happened. And there is a photo just over there of, of Einstein and Humison and, and, and Hubble and many other, St. John as well, where many talks have been given. This building was built in, what, 1902? So the campus was founded at that time, or the observatory itself, but the building is 1912. 1912. Yeah. So 103 years old. And I, I've i been a kid in a candy store going through this place. It's been fantastic. And I just, I love all, all of what we're looking around here are actual academic journals. We have a couple journals here um, from Edwin Hubble that we will talk about a little bit later on in the show. But first, I, I want to get in uh, with Nick here. Hubble joined Mount Wilson when? When did he, he join us? He arrived in August of 1919. Uh, and there's actually a little bit of an interesting story to that. Uh, uh, Hubble studied astronomy at Yerkes. Uh, and then when World War I, when U.S. joined World War I, he wanted to join with the Army. Um, and, and Hale had already kind of tapped Hubble to come. Hello, Hubble Huggers, and welcome to this week's Hubble Hangout. My name is Tony Darnell. I work at the Space Telescope Science Institute. And this week, we've got another great hangout planned for you. It's a little bit different this time. Uh, we're going to be taking a look at uh, the man, uh, Edwin Hubble, the astronomer from which uh, the Hubble Space Telescope is named after. And uh, this is the, we are in the week before the 20th anniversary of the launch of this. 25th anniversary of the uh, launch of the Space Shuttle Discovery, which put Hubble into orbit. And all next week, we've got all kinds of festivities and events planned. But I, but then this was Scott's idea, and I thought this was a good one. It'd be a good. This is a great opportunity for us to kind of take a look back at some of the important work that uh, that Edwin Hubble had done back when. Uh, uh, back in the early part of the of the 20th century, and so today he is uh, he is currently out at Mount Wilson with some with some people who are going to help us understand a little bit more about Eben Hubble. But before I get to that, let me give you a couple of announcements. First of all, there is a new Hubble ebook out. It was just put out yesterday uh, to celebrate the 25th anniversary. The link to where you can get it is in the description box below. Also. Uh, if you participate, even though Hubble Mania is over, if you participated and helped vote uh, to select the the winning image, our graphic artist better do it. So, um, <laughs> real quick, so to be, with our introductions, we're actually at the Carnegie Observatory's office here in Pasadena, which is uh, who owns the telescopes up at Mount Wilson. So we chose a warmer climate because it is a little chilly up at Mount Wilson. But uh, with me here is Nick. Uh, he is a Hello. senior docent up at Mount Wilson. And I am awful with pronouncing your last name. Uh, that's quite right. I have trouble with it myself. Do you? Uh, Arkimovich. Arkimovich. So but Nick, Nick Arkimovich. is fine. 
and, and he is a fantastic senior docent up there, gives a lot of the special tours. How long have you been up there? Uh, about 11 years now. I've 11 been years. Tours. Very nice. And, and this guy over here, um, I mean, we just kind of added him in. He just happens to be the, the acting director of the Carnegie Observatory. Uh, and this is John, and again, horrible with names, John. Mulcahy. Mulcahy. John, Dr. John Mulcahy. Oh, man, that was a big fail, Scott, all around. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know, That's okay. It's, I, live with, a Lewis. I live with Scott Lewis. <laughs> yeah, all right? yeah, okay, fair enough. Anything more than five letters, and I'm done. So. I also so want to know how competitive you are. You had... You had to uh, you had to go somewhere to, that would finally uh, do do my bookcases uh, to put my bookcases. I had to shame, yeah. man. Yeah, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> we, have, um, we have hail photobombing us at the institute. Have put together some printables that you can not only just print out on your own printer, but you can get large format posters made as well. And uh, those are now up and available on the website uh, on hubblesite.org, and the links to those are also in the description box. And finally, I want to remind you that the Ode to Hubble video contest will be, the winner will be announced next week on Friday, a week from tomorrow. So look out, if you're entered into that uh, contest, That'll be your big day. There'll be two winners selected, one from uh, the uh, the category of 25 and, uh, and under and those older than 25. So take a look at, for those. And I still love the prize. That, yeah. that prize is amazing. So for, for those of you that entered or don't know about it, those that entered a video in there, you get a piece of the solar array that was taken down and when it was replaced and brought back down to Earth. So you get an actual piece of the Hubble Space Telescope uh, if you're a winner. So... Uh, good luck to those that made made it to the finalists, and uh, let me know your address because I might come by and steal it. <laughs> <laughs> well, that person talking is Scott Lewis. You guys remember him. He joins me every week as the driver of the internet. But this week it's a little bit different. He has organized this really interesting hangout. So he is going to uh, uh, be talking a lot with the people out at Mount Wilson. Uh, so, but before he gets started, I want before you announce ever or introduce our guests, would you uh, tell people how?